Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, to our audience out there and our panelists here, we are very excited to be here. Um, this is an opportunity for the um, Gullah Geechee culture to meet the Liberian culture in a way, um, and for people to get an understanding of what this is about. Um, we go around the room, we make introductions, and then we flow with our program. Um, I don't want to introduce each person, but we'll start with Ms. Kia Simmons here, um, who's the uh, CEO for Worldview. Um, they are an, a tourist company that we are in contact with and working with. Um, they do stuff in Africa and other places in the world. So, Kia? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Kia. I am the co founder of World Views. I'm sorry. And some feedback, so I'm trying to mute. Yes, okay. So my name is Kia Simmons, co-founder of Worldviews. We are a travel concierge company that specializes in business development on the continent, more specifically in East Africa, but we have our great partnership with our sisters and brothers that you see today in Liberia. So um, as we expand throughout the continent through travel, we're also going to be offering, or we're already offering investment opportunities, relocation assistance, and other services to our brothers and sisters of the diaspora, more specifically here in the US, UK and Canada. So thank you for joining us today. We have an exciting uh, panel of great people uh, that has some immense knowledge about the Gullah community, which I am from Charleston, South Carolina. I'm actually from James Island. Um, so it's an island off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and uh, we will be diving into the Gullah culture and the connection between the Gullah people and Liberia. So super excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Clarice. Good morning. I'm Clarice Ford Kula. Um, let's see. So I'm, I was born in Liberia, raised in America <laughs> my entire life. I, was privy to be able to go back and forth, taking time out to understand both cultures, living in both cultures. So I am here to talk a little bit about the Year of the Diaspora, where we're welcoming all of our brothers and sisters, all of our cousins, the Gullah Geechee people, everybody back to Liberia for just a wonderful time to you know just spend time getting to know one another. Um, for some people, we'll be relearning each other. Uh, so yeah, we're just here to talk about that connection between the Gullah Geechee people, um, the tour that's happening in South Carolina, as well as the tour that's happening in Liberia. Hester? Wonderful, Hester. You're on mute, Hester. You can unmute yourself. Okay, we may be having a little bit of technical difficulties with Hester. So we move ahead to Mr. Richard Warren. Um, Mr. Warren is an author. Um, he has some expertise on the um, Gullah Good Gichi um, culture, and he will be sharing with us, you know, a lot of that knowledge here today. Um, Hester, we'll come back to you. We know you just turned off your mute, but we'll come back to you. Let Richard go ahead, and we'll come right back to you. Richard. Yes, sir. Hello, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Richard Paul Dante Warren Sr. I'm a proud Gullah Geechee native from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm an author, as was said. Um, so my first book written was 20 Historical Black Natives of Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm really thankful for this experience um, on the cover. It's featured James Gervin Smith. Um, so I am really, really excited to talk about his legacy today. Beautiful. Now we come back to Hester. Hester, please unmute and share with us your role. You have a very <laughs> critical role being on the ground and being in the tourism sector already and with a significant expertise in terms of how we can make things happen in Liberia. Esther, you can unmute. Okay, there we go. I am. 
a conversation that's been long. Some of you here to hear more about the other people and see the goals that we are yeah, we, we have a problem hearing you, Hester. Is not coming through. Oh, um, you do the conversation and see how we know our face with our brothers and sisters. Or as we. Okay. Hester, you're glitching really hard. We can't hear anything. We can't hear anything. The grind is tough, Hester. So we're actually going mute. Um, and we'll go over to Mr. Wallace, Mr. Carlos Wallace Smith Jr. He's um a great grandson of um Dr. James Um Skirvin Smith, and he can give us his intro in a little bit before we get into the deep conversation. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Tukba. Again, my name is Carlos Wallace Smith Jr. I'm the great, great grandson of Dr. James Kirvin Smith. I'm extremely excited to be a part of this panel because it's been too long that Dr. Smith, um, his legacy, his contribution to both Liberia and the United States of America, especially the African-American community, and specifically Charleston and the Kula Geechee people uh, has been forgotten. And that Mr. Richard Warren would take the time to do this research to unearth the legacy of this great man is an exciting accomplishment, is one that is way overdue. And Mr. Warren, I can't thank you enough. Your contribution is going to go a long way in enlightening both the Gullah Gucci community, the African-American community, and Liberia as a whole. And this story of Dr. Smith is going to serve as an inspiration to a lot of young people on both sides of the Atlantic. It is our hope that by the end of this program, more people will get to know who Dr. Smith was, what he accomplished, the contribution he's made, and hopefully more people would take interest in his story and his legacy and can contribute to uh, this growing um, mountain of literature on Dr. Smith. So again, I'm very excited and very happy to be a, a part of this panel. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so folks, that's our panel. Um, and now I will turn over to Kia. She is our um, program manager for the day and will direct how we proceed. So Kia, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we will be proceeding with, oh, wait a minute. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah, I was like, what happened to everybody? Okay, just keep in mind, guys, this is live. So y'all bear with us as we move forward. Um, but so the next thing we will talk about, the purpose of this conversation, bringing the awareness uh, to the connection between the Gullah people and Liberia. I would like to start with Mr. Richard um, and his views on the purpose of this <laughs> and how he has, as we've already spoke, how he has contributed to bringing awareness uh, about the Gullah people, but now uh, connecting Liberia to our culture. Uh, Mr. Warren. Yes, Sister Kia. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you that's involved with this, because this is very important uh, to connect the dots throughout the diaspora. Um, we are family. We are family all over this world. Uh, we went to different parts of the world together and we returned to different parts of the world together. Um, and even though those connections are, you know, some of those connections have been lost, we are working towards rebuilding those connections. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, both you and I, we are Gullah Geechee natives. Um, you know, it's, it's baffling that the world really don't know about us. We're like one of America's best kept secrets. <laughs> you know, um, for those who don't know who, who don't know who Gullah Geechee natives are, um, we Gullah Geechee people, we are the descendants of West Africans that came directly over to the East Coast um, through slavery. Um, we are di direct descendants of West Africans. We have retained uh, much of our African heritage, culture, and traditions. Um, you know, 
We've arrived to Charleston, South Carolina as early as the 1500s. And uh, we just blended all of our African cultures together. And out of that became a language, a Gala language. Um, the way we eat, the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we dance. You know, uh, in Liberia and Nigeria and Sierra Leone, you know, they love jollof rice. Well, Gala Geechee natives, our version of jollof rice is red rice. You know, it's just a distant cousin to the cuisine dish. Um, the way we talk, you know, uh, you know, if I call my uncle, I might say, uncle, how you be for do? You know, you know, some people call it a broken, a broken, a broken English, but I call it our language. You know, um, you know, my uncle might say, oh, I write you, oh, I did fine, you know. Um, and it's really close to, you know, Liberia, you know, the way, you know, they speak in Liberia. Um, if it's fine with you, I want to dive directly into the, the, the history of Liberia and, you know, um, so I'm an author and I wrote my book, 20 Historic and Black Natives of Charleston, South Carolina. And the person that I chose the feature on the cover is James uh, Skiverin Smith, uh, Dr. James Skiverin Smith. Um, a lot of people in Charleston don't know about him, which is unfortunate, but we're working towards bringing his legacy back to the forefront of history as it should be. Um, he, be he went to Liberia and became the sixth president of Liberia. But I'll just, you know, I'll just start from the beginning. So we all know Liberia was founded in January, on January 7th, 1822. Uh, the Society for the Colorization of Free People of Color of America was established in 1816, which later became ACS, the American Colonization Society. Between 1821 and 1847, a few thousand African-Americans immigrated to Liberia. During this time, Dr. Smith and his family happened to be one of those African-American families that migrated back to Liberia. In 1833, he arrived in Liberia at the age of eight. However, we begin to see that his story is really res resilient because in that same year, he lost his parents to malaria. Now, losing your parents at that young, you know, that may deter a lot of people from being successful, but that didn't stop him at all. Uh, during his youth, he started training under the medical doctor of the ACS um, and maybe losing his parents to a fever that most likely was malaria. Maybe that motivated him to become a physician, um, but he definitely started studying medicine and eventually returned to the United States to get his medical degree. Now, not only is his legacy special because he left Charleston and, be and eventually became the sixth president of Liberia, He's also the second African-American in the United States to obtain a doctor medical degree. Now, many, if not all, African-Americans should know about this. Um, so that's why this work is so important. Um, so after he obtained his doctor's medical degree, he returned to Liberia and he served as a physician, helping the people in Liberia, providing his services, providing his medical services before starting his medical, uh, before starting his political career, excuse me. Uh, so he held a different, a lot of different political positions. In 1855, he was elected to the Senate of Grand uh, Bassa County before serving as the Secretary of State from 1856 to 1860. And in 1869, he served as the Vice President of Liberia before becoming the sixth President of Liberia in 1871. And even after serving as the President, he didn't stop his political career there. Uh, from 1874 to 1884, he served as a superintendent of, of Grand Bassett County. So when you look at his lifetime, he spent majority, if not all, of his lifetime being of service to his brothers and sisters in Liberia and really making a statement and really making his staple in Liberia. Um, so his legacy is great. Um, there's a big connection between Liberia and Charleston that's not discussed nearly enough. Um, so during his time of serving as a superintendent of Grand Bassett County, something extraordinary happened. Uh, the, great the Great Migration in Liberia. So that's when a ship uh, named the Azor ship, it left Charleston on April 21st, 1878, transporting 206 Africans from Charleston back to Liberia. And this became known as the Liberia Exodus. One of those Charlestonians that was on that ship is named Clements Iron. And when he arrived in Liberia, he eventually created the first steamship constructed in Liberia. So then when you talk about 
the legacy that Charlestonians made when arriving in Charleston, I want to uh, share a few other individuals. So you have Samuel David Ferguson, who was born in Charleston, South Carolina on January 1st, 1842. He was the first African-American elected as an Episcopal church bishop in Liberia. And in 1889, he established the Cuntington, the Cuntington University in Cape Palmas. <laughs> and then Thomas McCant, we have Thomas McCant Stewart, who was born in Charleston, December 28, 1853, who migrated to Liberia in 1883 and served as a professor at the Liberia College. And then one more, we have Boston Jenkins Drayton, who was born in Charleston in 1821, who served as the Chief Justice of Liberia from 1861 to 1864. So these are just a few names I came across in my research, but you know, there's no telling how many Charlestonians relocated to Liberia and left a significant impact that should be remembered by us all. So it's a beautiful legacy. Well done, well done. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that information. I, I don't think Thank you all. any of us knew uh, how much uh, Charlestonians uh, of the Low Country has contributed to the Liberian uh, uh, culture and uh, politics and things of that nature. So not only are we able to trek to Liberia, but Liberians should now trek themselves to Charleston, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and one more, one more about uh, Samuel David Ferguson. So the Julius C. Emery Hall near Clay Ashland, uh, that's also um, an establishment he founded. So we wow. have two educational centers, you know, founded by a Charlestonian, founded in Liberia. You know, our people were really making moves. They didn't stay stagnant. You know, after slavery, they didn't stay stagnant. They was motivated and they were successful and they left uh, a great legacy for us to remember and for us to build on and continue to build. Our story isn't over yet. No, our story is just starting to be told. And wonderful yes. that we have young people who are really interested in the culture, um, we have some older people who can provide historical perspective and be able to blend those to really present the black story. And somebody, when I posted this link, somebody on Facebook said the black story must be told. And, you know, that's where we are. So yes. we we'll pass it on to Mr. Carlos Wallace Smith to add on to that beautiful presentation and information shared by Mr. Warren, our, you know, author on the panel. Absolutely. Uh, let me just start with the uh, Gullah Geechee people. So uh, just to add to what uh, Mr. Warren said, um, the Gullah Geechee people had a particular skill that uh, most of the other slaves didn't have. They were expert in rice cultivation. And it was for that reason that they were unfortunately high priced slaves. And part of the reason they maintained their culture was because there was a lot of rice being grown in that part of America. And so there was a large concentration of what became known as the Gullah Geechee people. You have that large concentration of, the, of people from the same part of Africa. It is easy to maintain your culture because, it's, because everybody has it. Um, there's an author, he's probably uh, the foremost expert on the Gullah Geechee uh, on Gullah Geechee history. Uh, his name is uh, Lorenzo Turner. He wrote a book called Africanisms in the Gullah Dialect. And Dr. Turner did a lot of research. And one of the things he found was that the word Gullah may be a corruption of the word Gullah, which is a tribe in Liberia. He also, he also determined that Geechee could be a corruption of the word Kisi, which is another tribe in Liberia. But perhaps the most um, amazing and, and um, surprising 
discovery he made was that the Gullah Geechee people did not belong to one particular tribal group in Liberia, as some seem to think. They came from different tribes, the Mende, the Gullahs, uh, the Konos, the Limbas. There was a whole bunch of different tribes. And because they all came together in that Charleston area in that whole low country belt, they interacted. There was a mixture of language and culture. Over time, this, mix, this mixture merged into this new culture and this new language that is now the Gullah Geechee language and culture. And if this was uh, found by uh, Dr. Lorenzo Turner, and if you can find his book, The Africanisms in uh, Gullah Dialect. I just wanted to uh, add that. To Dr. Smith, just to add, in addition to Dr. Smith losing his parents, after they both died, the two older siblings, one was uh, 15, the other was 13. Both of them died too. Um, the 13 year old died right after her parents died and the 15 year old died 10 years later. So think about it, you had, you said they were just babies now. They were just babies now. But that was a culture that uh, that we have, whether you're in America or you're in Africa, Negroes have this culture where we will care for one another. And there were other families from uh, Charleston that immigrated with the Smiths to Liberia. Well, we don't have any empirical proof, but we can infer that some of those families may have taken them in and helped to provide guidance and care. Uh, Dr. Smith went to work with uh, Dr. Lugenbill. I think uh, Mr. Warren mentioned that he was the ACS, was white ACS doctor assigned to Liberia at the time. And he was an understudy of Dr. U uh, Lugenbill. And I'm not sure if Dr. Lugenbill was um, instrumental in He's coming back to America to study, but after exhausting his study on a Dr. Lugenbill, Dr. Smith came to America and went to Brookshire College. And of course, uh, as Dr. Uh, Mr. Warren said, after he completed his study, he returned. And upon his return, it was thought that there was no reason to send another white doctor to Liberia since Dr. Smith was qualified, and so he became the medical agent to the colony. He started off his practice in Sino. Uh, but just like all of the Smiths, there is something uh, that pushes us towards the, the arts and the humanities. And so he eventually left medicine, moved back um, to the Monrovia area and eventually to uh, the Bassa area and decided to get engaged in politics. So he ran for office, became Senator. He later served as Secretary of State. And during that time, there were two classes of settlers. You had the mulattoes and the dark skinned settlers. And even then, the there were some segregation. The light skinned ones thought of themselves as better than the dark skinned ones, and that spilled over into the politics. At that time, the only party in Liberia was the Republican Party, and they were all members of the Republican Party. But when the dark skinned settlers realized that uh, upward mobility in politics was a little more difficult for them because of the color of their skin they decided they would form their own party. And so they called a meeting in Clay Ashland. Uh, it's one of the settlements on, the, on, I believe it's the uh, Eastern bank of the uh, St. Paul River. And at that meeting, they decided to form a party. They formed the True Week Party. And it was at that meeting that uh, Edward James Roy was elected as the standard bearer and Dr. Smith 
was elected as the vice general there. They proceeded to run against uh, James Sprick Spain and defeated Sprick Spain. And that how, that's how Roy became president, Smith became vice president. Of course, eventually Roy got overthrown. Uh, there's a whole different story about why he got overthrown and Dr. Smith became the sixth president of the Republic of Liberia. Uh, 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 Mr. Warren mentioned that even after that, he went and became senator, I mean, superintendent. Now that is probably the most fascinating aspect of his legacy. I don't know of anybody who served as secretary of state, vice president, president, and then agreed to come back and be superintendent. So superintendent is, uh, is, like you you starting off your career again on you are moving up the political ladder in Liberia. But he this tell you the depth of his humility. He didn't plan on becoming superintendent. After all the commotion surrounding the Arroy episode, he decided he wasn't gonna run for office again after uh his term was completed. So he left, retired, and moved back home to Buchanan. Well, the new president takes over and said, Dr. Smith, since you want to remain home and not stay in Monrovia, you're there. Would you like to continue serving your country by administering the affairs of Grand Bassett County? He said, yes. And he became superintendent. Absolutely amazing. Most of us, won, 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 we, we would think it is an insult to be asked that. Dr. Smith didn't think that. He served, and I believe he served for superintendent for over 10 years after that. Now his son, James Griffin Smith Jr., was also a successful politician. He started off being a priest in the Episcopal Church. And he, in the aftermath of the uh, uh, King, Fernando Poe episode in Liberian history, where uh, Charles D.B. King, the president of Liberia, along with his vice president, Alan Yancey, were accused of uh, sending Liberian natives to uh, the island of Fernando Poe. There was a United States congressional investigation into, the, uh, into that episode. In the aftermath of that, President uh, King and his vice president resigned and a new administration took over. It was, in, uh, it was during that period that Father Smith, James Curvin Smith Jr. was asked to serve as vice president. So he served as vice president to uh, President Barkley, Edwin Barkley, for I believe 14 years. And it was after they left office that Tupman took over. But Tupman, uh, he was such a figure that nobody remember anybody that came prior to him. He dominated Liberian politics, Liberian culture, and every aspect of Liberian life to the extent. And for so long, 27 years, that no people barely remember what happened before Tupman. But James Griffin Smith Jr. was his vice president just before Tupman became president. And so he too was an extremely successful politician in Liberia. I, I'm just gonna pause here uh, unless somebody has uh, a question. No, that, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful, wonderful connection. It's, it's heartwarming to hear these stories. And, 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 let me just add this. Sure. Although I'm here representing the uh, Smith family as the great great grandson of Dr. James Scriven Smith, I want the people on the panel, everybody on the panel, and people listening to know that there are also two relatives of Dr. Smith on this panel also. Dr. Clarice Ford Kula is also a descendant of Dr. Smith. She's my cousin. And Hester Baker is also connected to Dr. Smith being a cousin. And so 
I'm the one doing the talking on behalf because I got the Smith name, <laughs> you know, but they are both directly connected to Dr. Smith. I just wanted to, to know that. And I know my cousin Kenneth Smith and all of my other cousins are listening right, 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 right now too. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Um, hey, thank you. We have said our, are connected with the Smith on the Johnson line. So, yeah. Correct. Because, uh, 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 the granddaughter of Elijah Johnson, who was one of the most prominent settlers in Liberia, his contribution to uh, the early settlements and the formation of Liberia is enormous. Elijah Johnson, it was his granddaughter that was married to, uh, 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 that, that is the uh, mother of James Kirvin Smith. I would so, like to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, I would like to ask Mr. Warren if he had any questions for you now that you are you were able to share a lot of information and um, he initiated this research, not knowing that he would actually meet the great grandson of Mr. Smith. Um, I wanna give him this time to see if he have any questions or anything to add, Mr. Warren. Oh my God! I might need my uh, my own live session. <laughs> of course, I, I have a million questions. You know, um, you know, it's just fascinating. Um, any more information that could be provided on his legacy? You know, I would love to know. You know, um, like was he married? You know, who was his wife? Because that's not something that you know that's not listed in history. And you know, you know, what is a man without a woman? <laughs> so. Uh, you know, she definitely, you know, her legacy definitely has to be told, too. So I'm not sure if he was ever married, um, you know, you know, any piece that's missing to the puzzle. You know, I would love to know about, you know, his great legacy. And, and just just to add to some of that, um, like he mentioned, his cousin Kenneth last night, giving some other information, the actual manifest of slaves that uh, were on that particular ship. Um, you know, some pictures of him, some pictures of his grandfather, his speech that he made when he was trying to exit out of politics and stuff. So they, I think the Smith family has a nice collection of different artifacts and other information that's very relative to Dr. Smith. So, wow, um, it just, it, yeah, it, it's very wonderful. And that I just want to mention here, you know, earlier you had said, you know, Liberia was founded in 1822. There's a little disconnect there because there were Liberians on the ground in the indigenous people that were met that the um free slaves or the you know whoever went to liberia as you know, with the colonial american colonization society met on the ground and dr carl patrick borough is a liberian historian who has written a book um between the cooler forest and the salty sea liberia before the 1800s that catalog okay. how liberians migrated whether from you know fighting in other areas or whether just searching a better future how they migrated towards what is now Liberia, and which was actually a larger portion. But again, from his from the history we learn, the French with Ivory Coast and the British with Ceylon kind of took a piece of our land that was supposed to be Liberia. So there's a lot of rich history there. Um, and it's just important that as we try to awaken this sense of tourism, it can be tied in directly to the historical reference and I like to use that as a means where we can build our own nationalism um, and our patriotism towards our country as a whole. And we want people to understand what it means to be Liberian, the, the, the diverse strengths we have. You guys, uh, in a subset, identify the relationship directly with South Carolina. But there are other areas that the free slaves came from, like our family, the Dunn family, and Clarice is our family historian. She's also my cousin, can relate you know, to people in America and trace that family history. So there's a lot of inner connections that exist besides just the um, geopolitical relationship between Liberia and the U.S. There are personal relationships um, with the people on the ground. I met a young lady called Torbert. I think she's a twin who has traced her history and connection with the Torbert family, you know, from Liberia. So it's just important that we build this and we look at Liberia as a destination that people can go to and be in the the co only country in Africa that has in this constitution, anybody of Negro descent can be a citizen, targeting specifically the diaspora um, population. It will be wonderful if we can continue to build on this, build on these relationships and work towards, you know, having a wonderful bonding 
of Africans and, you know, pushing the whole pan-Africanism where Af the African people are one people and can work together, you know, very collaboratively and peacefully. So um, we can come to Hester now. Hester, if you can unmute, let's hear from you because we know you have a lot to share with us, especially that story about the guy you tried to pressure to admit he was Liberian. I would love to hear that story again. So you see, folks, we really have to work on our infrastructure, our telecom infrastructure in Liberia, and we see the challenges that Hester is facing. So in some places, the network is good. People can come through. Um, like last night, I had a, um, a live with a guy on um, called Emmanuel Savis on um, the walk and economic crime school, and he came through very well in different spots where he could move and position himself. But we see Hester is having some challenges. So we'll continue this conversation. So this is leading to something, right, Clarice? Um, we are trying here to pick up the tourism sector in Liberia, and you have been, over the last like three, four years, we've been trying to work to build to something. So what do mm -hmm. you envisage um, this kind of, these kind of discussions um, impacting where we're trying to go? Well, these kind of conversations help um, to impact us in such a way that it's more of a reunion, a friendship, a relationship, all of the above. So we're communing with our cousins, the Gullah Geechee people, the African-American people, all these different groups of people who represent some form of Africanism. And the goal is to go back to Liberia, you know, have a little reunion, get to know ourselves, get to know one another. Um, introduce you guys to our beautiful country, Liberia, take you on some tours. Some of them are historical tours where you learn about the history and culture of Liberia. Some of them are tours just to have some fun. Maybe you check out our beaches. You know, we're known for surfing in certain parts of Liberia. So we would love to take our people home, get them acclimated to the culture, the history, all that good stuff. Also have a little bit of fun on the beaches. Um, honor those people whose families did leave America all those years ago and did die. Um, in Liberia, whether it was malaria, what it was, whatever. Then also honoring the people that we met there when we got uh, to Liberia, because it, like Isaac said, before 1822, there were people living there. And so those people are also represented um, in Liberia. So when we go, we want to connect those dots. We want to also help people whose parents or grand, great, great grandparents run on the ship, help them find their, their American counterparts and help the American counterparts find the Liberian counterparts because when some people had children here before they left and then when they got to Liberia they have more children so you have those distant cousins that don't even know of one another so the, the goal is helping to find you know mm -hmm. those people and get them reconnected which is what for me a reunion is is when you reconnect with those people and then also looking at the fact that we had a civil war in Liberia that was fought for a great number of years and since that time many of us have not connected with our family members you know like me with my Dunn family when we left um I grew up here, so I didn't really know too many of my Dunn family on ground. And then when I finally went back to Liberia, the Civil War happened, I came back to America. So, so many years were left. And so last year, a couple of years back, we got together and had a reunion. Well, some of us had never even met each other, but that reunion was something because we felt like we knew each other forever because family is family. There's nothing you can do about that. So it's that kind of thing, bringing all of us back together because the civil war took a lot from us, a, a whole lot. And I think it's time that we all got back together, learn each other. Some people ended up in Germany. Some people ended up in uh, some of the Hispanic countries. Some people ended up in Europe, UK, all those different places and learn different languages. Some people are in France, they learn to speak French, so many places. So now we come together, all of our children get to know one another. So these kinds of topics help us connect the dots with our culture the history, all that fun stuff. And then when we get to Liberia, we all know each other. We just kind of, you know, get together and make it happen. So that's, that's the goal of this whole exercise. And I'm very, very glad that we had this conversation because just like Mr. Warren said, many African-Americans did not know of Dr. Smith. Just like Mr. Carlos said, a lot of Liberians didn't know of Dr. Smith. You know, when I saw that he was a president, the sixth president, I was like, wait a minute, the sixth president? Because going back to what Mr. Carlos said, before Tupman, we don't remember, we remember Joseph Jenkins Roberts because he was the first president. We knew there were a whole bunch of other ones in between, but then we came to Tupman and Talbert, 
And that was it for us. <laughs> so it was good to go back and look at uh, Mr. Warren's research on Mr. Smith. I was just like, whoa, what is going on? This dude was the second African-American to get a medical degree. Are you kidding me? You know, so I was very excited to find that out. And then I said, well, now let's see if we can find any of his relatives. So I was equally excited when Isaac connected me with Kenneth and then Kenneth connected me with Mr. Carlos Wallace and we got him on the call. And then Ms. Kia connected us with Mr. Warren. And I'm like, this is just amazing. So I thank God for this opportunity for us to come here today. I would dare to say as family members, but also as friends to talk about something that's dear to my heart, which is the history and culture of the African people. So there it is. I would like And what's important, yes. you know, you made a point that I did not ever think about before that we uh -huh. knew Joseph Jingen Rawls and then we knew William V. S. Tutman. Yeah. So today, many of the young people in Liberia, they only they think that history just started since after <laughs> yeah. the war. So yeah. that's why the work of Mr. Warren, the work of Mr. Um, you know, Smith explaining this stuff, the work of Dr. Carl Patrick, Dr. Borrows. you know, it is it, it, so important. Even history Dr. Dr. So William Allen. Yeah, for Dr. us to William identify Allen, yeah. ourselves, mm -hmm. for us to be able to understand who we are. Yes. So this is very exciting for me too. I'm not a historian, but I'm just enjoying the vibe and the feeling mm -hmm. I'm getting. Yeah, the different connection and different strands and how they relate. So that's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. so worldviews, um, you know, with Kia and her group. Kia, you're on mute because I'm coming to you. Um, they are trying to do the same thing in terms of bringing culture to the rest of the world in different places. And they have this tool at the uh, um, with the you know Gullah Gichi people. Uh, so you mm -hmm. can tell us a little bit about the tour and what is coming next, and you know what's happening. Yes, as you said before, this is all exciting to bring it all full circle. I'm going to mute you guys as we get some feedback. But uh, to bring it full circle, um, you know, I, I'm proud to be a uh, Gullah Geechee and, and raised up in, in the beautiful for low country. And so for us to be able to share this information with the rest of the world, but now we have seen, we have direct connections with Liberia and not only Liberia, you know, I have to bring up East Africa as well. Um, a lot, a lot of people do not know that some historians also speak about the East Africa connection that we have in the Low Country, especially the Gullah people. Now, out of Kenya, you do have a collect, a collect, a collective of nine tribes that are called the Gullah tribes in West, uh, or excuse me, Northern Kenya. Um, and some historians also contribute to our dialect derived from Kiswahili. Um, so this can also contribute to. Um, the freed Africans already being on that land prior to the slave trade, as we know that there wasn't a huge slave trade from East Africa as far as Europeans, but it was more of an Arab slave trade through Tanzania um, going up into the northern sub-Saharan area. Uh, so, but when you look at the transatlantic trade slave, trade slaves, or what is it, slave trade, excuse me, it's mostly West Africa. So I found it very interesting to find some of that history with my trek going back and forth to East Africa and finding out that my family was heavily, um, a heavy <clears throat> of Kenyan and of the Luya tribe. Um, but I also found out is that our family was, uh, we originated from East Africa, the Rift Valley area, but then we went back and forth from East Africa to West Africa, East Africa to West Africa, and then we ended up in South Carolina. So we have a rich history that um, that goes throughout the entire continent, but it's so beautiful that we're able to connect right there in West Africa because it's the easier trek, right? They're going way across the continent. <laughs> it's, it's much easier, but we also have that history right here in our backyard. Um, right there in South Carolina, in the entire coast, um, going from North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida. But that history in South Carolina is really rich. So we do have our Gullah tour that is November the 5th through the 12th, the, 4th, the 15th through the 12th. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, and we will be trekking to Charleston, South Carolina and St. Helena, Beaufort, South Carolina, where you you really get to learn the history of the Gullah people and then the history of how we've made a difference in the low country. And now uh, 
uh, also speak into how we were able to contribute to, to the politics and everything else in Liberia. So if you all are interested, anybody that's uh, watching, please go to our website at uh, wvsvs.com. Uh, but we'll also be making our trek to Liberia as well. So once you see your history here on this land, now it's time for you to go ahead and make that trek and that connection over to Liberia. So we'll, we'll be going in December. So for those who are interested, please um, please check out the website. I'll let Ms. Clarice talk about the website and everything concerning in December. But that is our connection between Liberia and, and the Gullah people. Okay, and so after we trek to North Carolina, because I will be there too. I told my daughter she was excited. South Carolina. South Carolina. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so South Carolina. Yes. We'll be trekking <laughs> to South Carolina. Yes, to Charleston um, this November. And then in December, from December, well, the entire month of December will be back and forth in Liberia, but the concentration will be December the 17th, 18th, that weekend, all the way through January 3rd with a series of activities. And it, if you would like to join us, that would be great. Um, our website is www.libyearofthediaspora.org. So again, www.libyearofthediaspora.org. So check us out there and you can get all the information you need. It's going to be a wonderful time. We can guarantee that. And we look forward to having each of us as we spend time together as cousins. I love it. <laughs> wonderful. So we just want to draw a line of parallel to what happened in Ghana recently over the last you know, couple of years with the year of the return. And now Ghana is looking to building a city of the return where they're putting full billion dollars into you know, building a city that um, Africans in the diaspora can come to, especially targeting those in the um, US and in Europe. Um, so we are not there at that stage yet. We are starting off um, this process, and we just want people to understand that they are coming home. We want it to feel that way. We want people to feel like Liberia is home for them. Anybody of Negro descent that's embedded and enshrined in our constitution, and we want to really push that, that um, aspect of it. Um, we'll do everything we can to work with government to facilitate the environment where people coming in can feel free, can be a part of what's happening. Liberia can delve into our culture and understand it and easily assimilate and become a part of what we do. So um, many thanks to Clarice for the idea. Next year, 2022, makes it a bicentennial. That means 200 years since the, um, the settlers left um, the U.S. to um, arrive in Liberia. So it's also, next year will also be like a celebration of this, but we also are integrating our indigenous culture into this process. It hasn't been heralded enough. It hasn't been recognized enough. But again, the book from Dr. Carl Patrick Burroughs really delve into the different contributions from the spices, from the cola, you know, to the different things, and even some of the artwork, the Addison work that people do. Um, and just yesterday, somebody shared a mass with me that just come onto the, the Dan tribe of Liberia. It's a very popular mass. People want it. Um, he's doing this mask in silver as well, which is very unique. So there's a lot of things from our country that has influenced different things in the world. And even today, there are many Liberians in prominent positions in different places that we want to highlight from a historical perspective and achievement perspective. Similarly, those who went before us, like Dr. James Kerving Smith, that made significant contributions. Um, even the, I cannot remember his name, but the first, one of the first blacks to go to Harvard, he's Liberian. So there are just so many positive things that come from this little country and that we can really highlight from a historical perspective, from a cultural perspective, that makes it attractive for people to come to. Not to talk about the beautiful sites, the beaches, um, the ecotourism that's available there, you know, all through the year, you can go through our rainforest and just have a lot of experience because I was able to travel to the forest for like five days straight and walk, you know, miles and miles and miles. And that's an experience I think people should pay for and people will pay for. We just need to facilitate the opportunity that people can get from point A to point B. So I'm very excited about what's coming for Liberia. And hopefully the people out there who are listening will want to be a part of this and join us, especially those who are Africans you know, to be a part of this thing. So, um, Mr. Smith, we'll come back to you. Um, I don't know when the last time you were in Liberia and what's your current um, perception of it, but 
Edina, where you guys are from, is an extremely beautiful place. Um, the three rivers that come there, I think the Benson, the St. John's, and another river. Mecklen, Mecklen, Mecklen River. Mecklen River, right. Mm -hmm. And it just merged right into the Atlantic Ocean there. It's so wonderful and beautiful. I can see that being a, a tourist spot. I went there on Clarice and I actually went to visit there. We saw the statue of Bob Gray, you know, the, the some of the old buildings that are over there. So what's your perspective with regards to how this thing can ship out for us to be able to attract um, more of our people, many who have never been, and people of other, um, you know, orientations coming to Liberia? Sure. Um, well, first, Mr. Tukwa, let me just thank you. Let me just thank Sister Kia, uh, Cousin Clarice. What you guys are doing um, is an amazing thing. This lost connection between Liberia and the African-American community, especially the Gula Geechee community, um, is one that holds a lot of promise for both communities. Um, I think this is going to be monumental to both communities, especially for Liberia. Um, I can only hope that uh, those that wield power in Liberia will understand and appreciate uh, the premise that your project holds for Liberia, the potential for investment in tourism, in in uh, the possibility of getting some of our Gula Kichi brothers and sisters that have technical skills that can go back to Liberia and be of assistance to the brothers and sisters over there. Just opening that channel of movement, that channel of communication, that channel of cooperation between the two communities is going to serve Liberia in, a, in amazing, amazing, phenomenal ways. And I pray that those in power in Liberia will understand and appreciate that and will lend their unwavering support to your project. Um, whatever I can do in my lowly capacity, I will. I um, will try to uh, stay connected to Cousin Clarice and to you, Sister Kia. Hopefully, we can remain connected. Um, I've been planning on coming to uh, Charleston. I've never visited that before. But um, I, 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 I found out that, you know, just to, uh, you know, situate myself and the Smith family closer to you, uh, everybody know about Dr. Smith, but there was somebody before Dr. Smith. And his parents were Carlos and Catherine Smith, and that's where I got my name. So Carlos and Catherine Smith, they lived on Five Magazine uh, Street in Charleston in the 1830s. That's where they lived. That's where they lived until they boarded the Hercules Company, which is named name of the ship they boarded in 1832 uh, and arrived in 1833. Um, it is my understanding that that spot is still there, that the house is, of course, broken down. But up until a couple of years ago, it was a vacant lot. So I'm planning on going to visit there, but uh, but but another fascinating part of that, before the left, there was some things that were happening in Charleston and in America at the time. There were a lot of free blacks, Carlos Smith being one of them. And there were still a lot of slaves. There were all this, you know, there was uh, Haiti, there was the Haitian Revolution that had happened. Um, there, was the, there was the Gabriel conspiracy that had happened. And so there was this palpable fear in white America that the continued presence of free blacks posed a security threat to America, especially the slave economy, because they thought the free blacks would incite those that were still slave to revolt. And so much like what's happening now, there were all these, these anti-black laws that were being passed. 
one of those laws were passed in South Carolina, banning the only African church in Charleston. And now you know, black folks, the church is where everything happens. And especially back in those days where there were limited opportunity to gather, do anything, the church was everything. And one of the Methodist ministers in that church was Denmark Vassy. And Vassy was annoyed, as was all others, uh, all, all other Charlestonians. I believe my great 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 grandfather Carlos Smith too. And so they decided to act. Well, as the story was told, he put together the largest slave revolt in the history of America. He managed to convince over a thousand free and enslaved blacks to revolt. Dates were set, but prior to the execution of the plan, one of their brothers, feeling too loyal to his white master, when and exposed to plan. Then my vest Vassie was arrested along with uh, some of his alleged co-conspirators that were tried, of course, through a sham uh, court. And he, he was hanged. But it was in the aftermath of this whole Then my Vassie thing, with all the passions, you know, boiling and all of that, that the Smith decided, okay, we've, we've had enough. And so they were gonna leave. What is amazing was that on that same ship with Carlos and Catherine Smith and their children was Denmark Vassie's wife, Susan Vassie and her daughter. They too got on that same ship and immigrated to Liberia. So think about that. Denmark Vassie, and he's not an ordinary figure. He's such a towering figure in African-American and America history that Frederick Douglass invoked the name Dema Vesey during the Civil War to encourage the African-American battalion to fight. He used the name Dema Vesey, but his wife and her daughter was on that ship to Liberia. I just wanted to throw that, throw, 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 throw that in there. And to answer Mr. Warren's question about whether Dr. Smith was married and all of that, we don't know for sure because we have no documental evidence. But we know that James Kivern Smith Jr., his son, his mother was Jenny Ray Elizabeth Johnson. And Clarice would know that, that's how we're connected to the Johnson. So his mother was Jenny Ray Elizabeth Johnson. And if that was his mother and his father was Dr. James Kivern Smith, we can infer that Jenny Ray Elizabeth Johnson might have been his wife. So, uh, so that's your connection right there. And just 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 to add the dunce, the Smith are uh, very close to the dunce. Uh, my grandfather's name was Wallace Smith. Edward Dunn was his best friend. They went to Cuttington College together. They graduated in the same class. I believe Mr. Warren mentioned Cuttington because it was founded by Dr. Uh, Bishop Ferguson. They went, they went to that school and graduated together with very good friend. Edward Dunn, I believe, was superintendent uh, of, Grand uh, of, of, of Grand Bassett of County. County. Yes, as well. His yep. son, Dr. Elwood Dunn, Yes. And my father, a <laughs> childhood friend, they were very yep. good friends, they were best friends growing up. Mm -hmm. And I hope Dr. Dunn is listening because he's been an inspiration to me. Yes. He's contributed so much to writing the history of Liberia. He's written so many books, and I can both have read just about all of his books because uh, he's an amazing, an amazing author, an amazing historian. So the Dunns have contributed immensely to Liberia. And so, uh, Dr. Dunn, if you're listening, thank you very much. I, you know, appreciate your contribution. And to all the Dunns, you know, hats off to you guys. Well, before you, before you, you. Up, I want to ask one question. 
How many children did the doctor himself have? Say that again. How many children did he have? Dr. Smith? Yes. I'm not sure. Um, we're still looking. <laughs> the but, only one, the only one that I, 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 I that we have any information of was this James Kirvin Jr. Okay. But I know that he had a brother. Reason I know that he had a brother because. One of uh, Junior's, I said Junior to me, James Griffin Smith Junior. One of Junior's son, name was Jimmy Smith. But I know that that was his adopted son because that was his nephew that he adopted. So it means he must have had a sister or a brother who was the father or mother of Jimmy, his adopted son, right? And so that I know he had a sibling, but that part of the uh, the connection, we don't have that. And also the other children, he had a younger brother when they left Charleston and went to Liberia. Uh, uh, like, like Mr. Warren said, he was eight, but he had a younger brother who was four. His younger brother name was Carlos. So the youngest son name was Carlos, he was Carlos Jr. Um, he had he 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 had a sister named Anne. He had a sister named Dorothy. He had a sister named Margaret. We don't know anything about what happened to them. They were all orphans. So it's possible that different families from Charleston may have adopted them. It is also possible because there was this thing when uh, uh, during that period that if things weren't going too well with you in Liberia, you would immigrate to Sierra Leone to Freetown. There was this movement. So some people started off in Liberia and then move on to Sierra Leone. So there's a strong possibility, and my cousin Ken has been trying to educate me on that, that uh, he met somebody who told him that, they, that, that he was his relative from Sierra Leone when they heard his name and say, and say, if you're related to Carlos Smith, then we gotta be related because I'm descendant from a Carlos Smith from Sierra Leone. So it's possible that the young Carlos Jr., the one who was four years old when he left Charleston, may have been adopted by a family that moved to Sierra Leone. He may have stayed there. That we don't really know, but we're still working on that. Great. So Ken had managed to share some historical you know, items with me. I will just share them briefly, hopefully. Um, the screen sharing will work. Um, let's see if we can do some of that. I think um, Hester was trying to say something. Oh, let Hester go ahead. Not here now. Can you me? Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, okay. We'll tell it. I'm sorry. Folks, we are so sorry because Hester has a lot of information to give us. She's our ground expert, very knowledgeable about what's happening in the sector. She's been around and she's traveled the entire country, um, you know, identifying locations, looking at possibilities there, um, working with the international community and our, you know, um, government on how we can position tourism, you know, to our people. And she has her own personal stories as well. So. We just really, really want to hear from Hester. So Hester, if you can turn us your mute and just try and see if you can get a few words in, we appreciate it. Hester. Oh, I just want to comment in the comment section as we wait. Uh, for Hester, yes. So this is my kind of lecture our African-American brothers need to know and learn from. Thanks for your historical insight, brother. Thank you, thank you. That was one of the comments we had. That's, that's a good comment. And I just want to come in a little bit. So Clarice has a lot of skills. She also has okay. been produced. Oh, oh, I see your mute. Oh, sorry. So you want to mute? Clarice um, did a film called Providence. 
and we did a you know a debut of the film, a showing year in the DC area, and we invited you know um, Dr. Boris and some other people on a panel. And there's this discussion that needs to be had among African Americans and you know Africans in general. There's some sometimes a little friction there where you know one group feels the other group does not appreciate them. One group feels that they have been name called and stuff like that. So. We are also looking at this kind of discussion and opportunities um, as opportunities for us to get to know each other better, talk more, try to get on the same page. In the same way in Liberia, where we have a disconnect, like he was talking earlier among the free slaves, there were the light skin and the dark skin. In Liberia, there's this, um, you know, the, the, the settlers or the combination of people who came versus people who were there. We call it the country conquer dynamic. So, all of these things are things that we can have conversations about, get to know each other better and work with them. So I want to ask um, Mr. Warren, you know, during his research and stuff, did he find some of these dynamics existing even within the, the Gullah Gucci people or, um, you know, some of the people he talked to about, you know, disconnects um, for whatever reason that people cannot really try to collaborate and work together or some group feels superior to the other group? Did he experience any dynamic like that? Oh boy. <laughs> so so there's so much work to be done um, because there's so much miseducation that has been done to our people. So we have a lot of re-education to do and uh and just showing our people who we are. You know, even us Galagichi people with so much African DNA, so much African heritage. I mean, even the way we talk, I mean, even the way we look, you know, we have distinctive African features, even with our people. More, a lot of our people, it's hard to even tell them that they're African, <laughs> yet alone getting them to uh, the work with other Africans. Um, but, you know, there's efforts in place. Uh, a few years ago, I started uh, the Charleston Grand African Ball in Charleston, um, just as a incentive to get, you know, to get our local Gullah Geechee natives to embrace who they are, which is their African identity and their African heritage. Um, and that may be a starting place. And then with the right education, I believe um, once we get our people to know who they are, um, there won't be any pushback with working with our brothers and sisters, you know, at home in Mama Africa. Um, I consider myself a pan-Africanist um, and that's what's needed, pan-Africanism, um, because for us to have a surviving chance, we have to be united and we have to work together. All Africans across the globe, at home and abroad. Well, I, I want to, yes, I also want to ask him if he had any more questions for Mr. Smith um, going forward. I know you mentioned to me, I'm not sure if I'm, well, I'm not going to say it. You mentioned a book. So I don't want to say anything. Yes, okay. I, I would love, yes. Uh, so 20 Historical Black Natives of Charleston, South Carolina. That's a series that's uh, focused on because we have a lot of famous um, people from Charleston, South Carolina that deserves recogni recognition. So in this first volume, uh, Dr. Smith, I didn't really, I only scratched the surface with Dr. Smith. So I would love to do a book solely on him, um, you know, and who knows what that may lead to, maybe even a documentary, you know, whatever it takes to get our people in Charleston familiar with him. We deserve a statue of Dr. Smith in Charleston. We deserve for his picture to be anywhere it could be, you know. Um, we definitely deserve to bring him to the forefront in Charleston history um, because it's, you know, when I look at little black boys, little Gullah Gitche boys in Charleston and, and, and you look in their eyes and there's not much hope because they feel like they, you know, they don't have anything to emulate or who, who they could strive to be like. Of much, of many of them know the story of Dr. Smith. I think that would spark the light in their eyes and let them know, hey, I can be whatever I want to be. A black man was born here in Charleston and went to Liberia and became a sixth president, became the sixth president. Like, you know, we, we have great heroes and sheroes to emulate. Um, so so I definitely want to pursue more efforts um, to provide more information on Dr. Smith to the Charleston community and our whole community, uh, you know, across the world all together. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely hungry for as much information as I can, can get on Dr. Smith and the Smith family and their beautiful legacy that we won't let fade away with history. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. So yeah, yes. we can definitely connect connect the two of you, and you know, through Carlos, you can meet many of the other Smiths, and you know, get the variety of perspectives on their great great grandfather. 
and you know how they can impact so i would just share for um you know the the team here or actually everybody um if i share my screen i guess i can go to uh let me see if i can share a window okay so let me start with a window um and share first this is the bill of sale if you look at the bottom document type and the top is the slave's name so the names were Anne, Katie, Charles, James Green, Margaret, um, and these are basically the Smiths they're talking about yet. So this is the trustee of Carlos Smith, Bill of Sale for a slave name, Katie and her four children, Mary, Margaret, Anne, and Charles. So back in 1830, that's the date on this, um, May 15, I mean, um, April 15, 1830, um, that's you know, what they had there for the bill of sale. So it just showed how far we have come. Human beings were being sold, even though there's still some level of slave trade existing today, but this just shows that where an entire population was caught up in a slavery situation, um, you know, it's just not something that, as you say, we should be happy about, but it's history and it shows how far we have come and even how much farther we still have to take this journey you know, for equality and for our rights, you know, to be totally established where there's no distinction based on skin color. Um, another um, item that we can share here um, is the, uh, let me go by window. Um, some of the, some of the images we have, um, there, there's, there was a building that would be wonderful to share. I don't see it, I will try to get it. But this is a, a photo of the man himself. Um, I believe this is to cover your book, right? Yes, yes, that's the great honorable Dr. Smith himself. That's right. So, you know, um, history is here and we have a lot of opportunity to um, make, you know, some things happen. Um, can I also share with me a speech from Dr. Smith um, when he was um, as as president? His speech he delivered um, to people, and that's you know kind of long, so I won't share that. Um, but let's just see how we can continue these conversations in different way, inviting different people, touching base with different people, and being able to really bring history and everything to um, you know the world in general. I know we are targeted um, an hour. We've gone beyond an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. So Kia, as our closer and our program manager, I will turn it over to you and you can uh, we maybe get last words from the, um, the different panelists and then we can probably try to close out. All right, thank you. Yes, we have definitely went over. Um, oh, can you guys mute? We have some feedback. but. It was a great, 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 great conversation. We got a lot of information out, a lot of information, so much knowledge. And as Mr. Warren said, we just scratching the surface with these conversations. We hope that we can continue this conversation as we move forward towards both treks um, on the Gullah Geechee tour and the return to Liberia in December. I wanna correct my dates. They are from the 11th to the 15th of November. And again, you can go to WVSVS.com. I'm going to personally uh, invite Mr. Warren on our tour and because he got to indulge some of this information on the on the tour to these yes. people. So <laughs> that is my official invitation to you, sir. And um, it was a great pleasure having you. Thank you for coming on and sharing the information that he's such a young, young man and doing very, very great things. And that was one of my, my excitement that he's young and, and very, very in tune to what he's doing, what, is a, what it is that his mission is. And he's very serious about getting the information about the Gullah people and connecting us to the continent and very Pan-African as he says. I, I also uh, feel that I am Pan-African as well. I love my people. I love my people. And so thank you all for coming. And again, thank you, Mr. Warren. Thank you, Mr. Smith, 
for all of the knowledge that you have brought to the table. We didn't think in a million years starting this conversation off that we would be able to talk to a descendant, a direct descendant of Mr. Smith. So I want to thank you so much and make sure that you do keep in touch with us. Please get in touch with Mr. Warren. And uh, when you do get ready to come down to Charleston, please get in contact with us uh, so that we can personally uh, show you through the low country and uh, get you some good old Gullah Geechee food, okay? <laughs> that red rice. <laughs> yes. So you want to give each of them like 30 Can't seconds. Can't wait to have some of that rice. red rice. Oh, talking about the red rice, we do grow red rice in Liberia. Um, it's yes. Um, and I don't know whether you guys are talking about cooked red rice already, but we do have a variety mm -hmm. of rice that's highly nutritious. It's mm -hmm. pretty good for people who have high blood pressure and diabetes to eat because it, you know, it just that level of nutrition, it doesn't affect those situations and it's helped them to maintain a healthy diet. So hopefully, um, again, that market, that the opportunities are so huge in Liberia, just about how we can leverage the relationship or the opening the business environment that people can be able to utilize that. And this tourism and the investment aspect of it will also bring a lot of that to bear, to create jobs, to have opportunities for more Liberians. So we ask uh, Mr. Smith to go first for 30 seconds and close out. Then we ask Mr. Warren, then we ask Clarice, and then you can shut it down for us, um, Kia. Well, Brother Tupa, Sister Kia, Cousin Clarice, can't thank you guys enough for doing this. Um, I don't know uh, how you found me, but you did. Uh, and I'm glad you did. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to be a part of this panel. Uh, the legacy of Dr. Smith being exposed is way overdue. And so I cannot thank Brother Warren enough for the work that he has done. And this Pandora box that he's opened, I know will remain open and it's gonna lead to phenomenal things. And I know Brother Warren is gonna be in the forefront of it. Whether he knows it or not, pretty soon, he's gonna be awarded an honorary librarian citizenship with a country gown. Uh, oh so watch out God. for that. And when it happens, just, just, just remember, that Carlos Smith said it was gonna happen and it happened. And Sister Kia, you're gonna get one of those too. You guys are doing phenomenal work. I really do appreciate the work that you're doing. You know, I know Sister Clarice and Brother Tupa will thank you on behalf of all the Liberian people. When you get to Liberia, hopefully you're gonna get that appreciation from the government over there. But I just wanna express my deepest gratitude to all of you on behalf of the Smith family. And on behalf of all the families that immigrated, not just from the low country, but all over the United States of America that made it over there, who contributed so immensely to what Liberia is today and who represent uh, African-American history also. This connection that you guys, this bond that you guys I put it together now. This connection is going to lead to some, some really, really, really enormous uh, things. And I'm really glad to be a part of it. I thank you very much. God bless your project. And I look forward to coming to Charleston, eating some of that red rice, and staying connected to you guys. Thank you guys very much. Mr. Warren? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Um. As Mr. Smith has said, I also want to thank everyone. Mr. Smith, thank you so much. Um, like you said, you said you don't know how we found you, well, how they found you. Um, I don't know how they did either. I, I can't believe I'm looking at you on this camera right now, but <laughs> I, I, I am I am just grateful. I am thankful. Um, and you know, I know for sure the ancestors are proud of our efforts. You know, every other people in the world, they venerate their ancestors and they remember their ancestors. And uh, we definitely have to, too, as well. It's our responsibility. Um, so my spirit is full. I am motivated. This has charged me up. I'm fired up. You know, sometimes when you're doing work and it seems like the rest of the world doesn't care, sometimes you get the tears. Sometimes you're like, OK, 
you slow down, but this has really fired me up and I'm thankful and I'm grateful for this experience. Thank you, Sister Kia, for thanking of me and considering me and inviting me. Thank you all. Um, this has been a pleasure and both an honor and I'm ready to press forward. We got work to do. Let's do it. Thank Wonderful. you all so much. Wonderful. I guess I'm next. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for coming on the panel, each of you. When we contacted you guys, everybody was just excited to do it, Mr. Carlos. We had a long conversation, cousin Carlos, and he was very excited to come on. And then uh, Kia found Warren, he was excited to come on. So we thank God for this opportunity for us sharing here today. I wanna thank God for his stories around the world. Mr. Warren, I'm considering you to be one of them. Dr. Patrick Barrows, a very great mind of Liberia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Elwood Dunn, which happens to be my uncle, love him to death, great historian. And like uh, Mr. Carlos said, he has added tremendously to the history of Liberia. Um, also, Dr. William Allen, he wanted to come on, but he was traveling um, to one of the regions today in Liberia, so he couldn't come on today, but he's wonderful. So maybe in our next conversation, we'll invite um, a few of them to join us uh, to talk. I'm really bummed that Hester was not able to come on here and give her story, but I'm going to share her story with her, with you guys. So Hester, who used to live here in America, uh, ran into somebody apparently who was from the Gullah Geechee tribe. She argued this poor man down to the ground, okay, that he was a Liberian, he was undercover, he was hiding, he didn't want to tell her his real identity because he sounded so much like us, the people of Liberia. Only for her to later on find out that he was from the, the Geechee Gullah tribe of Charleston, um, South Carolina. So it's very interesting because I too come across people that sound exactly like us. And I'm like, well, where are they from? I can't really put my finger on it. You ask them and they tell you they're from this place or that place. And you're like, no, you're not. You're from Liberia because you're speaking our broken English. You're sounding like us. You look like us. You know what I mean? So how can you then say you're from somewhere else? But that's it. When you meet your people, you will know them. So whether they're from Liberia, whether they're from here, whether they're Gullah Geechee, African-American, doesn't matter. The point is they're your people. So you will know them, you know? And so I, I shared that with you guys. Another thing that Hester was going to talk about on here that I was very excited about, she was able to travel all across Liberia, all 15 counties in a matter of so many days, along with some people from the uh, tourism ministry. And they saw a lot of wonderful places in Liberia, met a lot of good people, learned some cultural things, some heritage things. And I really was hoping she could share that perhaps in our next conversation, uh, she'll be able to, I know she had some technical difficulties today, but we want to just uh, say thank you to Hessa. She's on ground, holding it down. Uh, Mrs. May Ure, uh, she's on ground, holding it down. We've got quite a few people on, in Liberia who are helping. We've got our people in the UK, uh, Mr. Henry, Treku and, and Miss Linda Marshall, they're also helping. We've got our people here in the US. So we just want to uh, say how excited we are. Angie is in Nigeria and she's helping to gather those people together. So it's going to be a wonderful time in Liberia this December. And I'm hoping that I can twist the arm of Mr. Warren to join us. I'm definitely going to twist Mr. Carlos. He's coming whether he wants to or not. So we'll all be there <laughs> having a good old time in Liberia. Um, this December. So again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity and thank you for honoring our invitation to come on and just uh, speak from your heart. Thanks right. again. So, yeah. so I just want to also add a couple of people. Um, we definitely, you know, have our European partners, the folks in the Ooh, European yes. Federation of Liberian yes. Associations are also a part of this effort. They are excited about it. Um, the, the president, Mr. Mayango Aku, and us, we've been on a couple of different conference calls and they are looking forward to the opportunity for them to also attract opportunities in Europe to Liberia as well. So um, this is all wonderful. And we want to say um, the role that the Liberian government has to play in the different entities that are involved in supporting the um, tourism sector and the investment sector is, you know, it's very huge. Their role is significant. The Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs and Tourism, I know there's a bill, you know, on the on the table to separate tourism as a separate entity um, that has not been finally approved yet, but it's something that's coming. So the significance of that um, Liberia National Tourism Agency or whatever the final name is going to be is very significant in making these things happen. We have a diaspora office at the Ministry of State that has been active in trying to engage people in the diaspora and push the tourism effort as well. We have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that's responsible for international cooperation. And under that umbrella also is the diaspora folks. 
So how they bring all these different entities together, including the different um, mayors of the big cities like the Maria City Corporation with Jefferson Koji and the Pinsley City Corporation with Pam um, Belcher Taylor and the, the security forces in terms of ensuring that our guests and even our own citizens are protected fully with regards to the rule of law. So all of those are important components in the tourism sector and we really look forward to our government, you know, playing an active role in engaging what we are doing, what other people are doing with regards to this. And even as you guys mentioned, yeah, with regards to the um, Gullah Geechee people, there are people from other parts of West Africa that are involved. So um, eventually, most likely, this will, could be a whole West African thing where the ECOWAS, um, the economic community of West African states can be involved in it and make this, you know, such a, I don't want to say, a, a financial boom for the for the region, but it has the possibility of doing that. And we even talked, Clarice, about because the free slaves actually came to Freetown before they went to Liberia. So we're thinking about a reenactment of that whole thing coming from Freetown, making a visit from Freetown to Liberia. And now um, Mr. Smith expanded our mindset that people actually left from Liberia and went back to Freetown as well, too. So, you know, so that's a whole, that whole bunch of different layers to how this thing can, you know, emerge and be such a wonderful event this beyond just a reunion for the economic opportunity for the region, for Liberia specifically, you know, is unlimited. So we are just excited about it and we just hope there can be a common ground of collaboration as we continue to push the um, importance of the tourism sector and the investment sector, you know, to our fellow Liberians and to our government in general. So Kia, you're the last person to speak. I just want to share this comment. It says, thank you all for the educational experience and historical American and African uh, connection. I'm looking forward to the low country visit and trip to Liberia. Awesome job. Thank you so much. We look forward for you to be coming uh, on that trip. I have nothing else to say. I, I got think one thing to say. Our oh. media partner on People's TV that facilitated this and also Worldviews that facilitated the StreamYard, you know, operation. So we continue to look forward to this partnership with between People's TV that's based in Liberia. I'm representing them here in the U.S and how we can build and continue to bring the message to the people. They are going to play a very important role in all these different you know, tourist events and pre presenting uh, what we have to the public. So um, if possible, I'm there. Maybe I can even bring the, 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 the visit to the low country. And I see my wife has said she's looking forward to that low country visit. So most likely we'll be there and be able to you know, bring it to the people of Liberia so they can see what's happening over there as well. So thank you, People's TV. Thank you. Um, um, Mimi Simok, who is the CEO of People's TV and is really working towards um, building a media empire around this that's really nonpartisan and focuses on the best for Liberia. So thank you. Peace. Thank you, guys.